after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week was dawning, Mary Magdalene went to see the tomb. Suddenly there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord, descending from heaven, came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his garments were as white as snow. The guards shook when they saw him, as though they were dead men. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He's not here. He is risen. just to the mercy of the strong. We worship the God who turns crosses into crowns. With hearts that long for life but fear the triumph of death, we worship the God who turns the vanquished into victors. Even in a dangerous world, Christ is risen. He is, he is risen, risen indeed. indeed. Even in a discouraging world, Christ is risen. He, he is, is risen, risen indeed. indeed. Even in a world that denies the power of love, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Thanks be to God.
little dance line up in front over here. <laughs> Welcome to Worship at Christ Post Train Church on this Easter Sunday. We're glad that you are here. I want you to know that the NCAA tournament has got nothing on us. March Madness, we have Madness here this morning because it's Easter, but also because uh, our wonderful nursery caregiver, Carol, broke her arm. Uh, and we found out today that she can't be here, and along with her daughter, who were our nursery caregivers today. So we are without nursery, that's what I mean by March Madness. <laughs> so so uh, after the children's time, there's uh, tables, activity tables in the back there. Uh, there is also, a, well, it's not a, really a cry room, we call it baby space, out by the coffee bar there where you can listen, good place for infants. Uh, but you know what, we're just gonna have a little madness, a little noise, kid noise is always welcome, especially on Easter, so it's all good. And it's all good that you're here. I invite you to turn and greet one another now in the name of our Lord. As I welcome all of you who are joining us online from wherever you may be, east to west, north to south, whether it's live, whether it's recorded, whether it's Easter day or another day, every day is the day of resurrection. Every day is Easter day. We're glad that you're here and we hope this is a blessed time for you wherever and whenever uh, you're watching this. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. <laughs> Hello, hello, no. <laughs> hello, Jameson, how are you? Just a few announcements this morning, and the first one's from Eileen. I am so excited to be making these announcements. Um, a couple years ago, we changed a little bit how we were doing Vacation Bible Experience because we had so many of our youth involved in it, and our wonderful friend, Sue Leesgang, uh, started teaching our kids, our middle school and high schoolers, how to interact with our littles. And as I was listening to Sue, I was like, huh, I think I have a lot to learn. <laughs> because like, um, and, and so it was this really phenomenal time, and our students have really come to love the wisdom and the knowledge of Miss Sue. And so she is now bringing that to a new parenting series that we have been doing here at the church. The first one that is coming up next is going to be on Friday, April 5th. It is a parent's night out, and this is designed for all parents. I actually got to go to one of the first ones that um, was happening, and I learned a ton. I have a two-and-a-half-year-old niece, and I immediately called my brother, and I was like, have you tried this? Have you thought about this? Because I got all these tips. And so um, the, the setup for this will be um, heavy hors d'oeuvres, and if you know our friend Miss Sue, she is amazing with the food. You will not leave hungry. Um, and Miss Kathy and middle school friends will have the child care, which will be super fun. Um, they had so much fun last time, they didn't even get to the movie. So um, we would love, love for you to sign up. There is more information available. There are flyers in the lobby. And then, starting April 17th, um, she is going to be starting a six-week class on Wednesdays from 5 to 7 p.m. Um, it is during the middle school hour. So if you are a parent of a tween or a teen or you even have teens or tweens coming up in your future, this is a really, really great opportunity. There will also be child care available if um, there are younger siblings, but it will um, coincide with middle school and it's free. Um, there will be like time to connect with other parents. So um, if you are interested in that, we would invite you to sign up. And for our parents of teens and tweens, when I announced this at middle school that this was happening, they were like, this is right. Miss Sue should be telling our parents <laughs> these wonderful <laughs> tips because she knows kids and she understands how to work with them. So they are actually excited for their parents to gain this wisdom as well. So um, details are in the bulletin, available online, and there are flyers in the back. So please join us for that. Thanks. <laughs> If that class were called, why does my husband keep doing that? My wife would be the first to sign up. <laughs> That's too good. Just a couple other things, just so you know, that some of the things that happen here. Uh, the third Friday of every month is Friday with Friends, which is uh, just an informal, no agenda gathering uh, for folks out on the patio. Uh, it's like appetizers, 
bring your own beverage. It's sort of like Presbyterian happy hour, really is what it is. And it's just uh, you know, re reconnecting again. Uh, also coming up, we're resuming our series of jazz at Christ Presbyterian Church. Uh, Sunday, April 21st, the Russell Bazette Trio will be here live in concert. You can find them on YouTube and listen to them, but uh, they'll be here live. And uh, before that, over in the garden next door, which is the Centella Street Community Garden, which is uh, an outreach of our church and our gift to the community, uh, they're hosting uh, for this, this concert. And they're having, well, I guess it's another little happy hour before the concert at three. But anyway, we'd love for you to come and be a part of the, uh, the concert that day. Uh, Da, 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 da. Yeah, you know that song. Uh, it's time for our summer camp fundraiser, which is movie night here in the sanctuary. We put a big screen here, and it's at Indiana Jones in the Dial of Destiny. So that's going to be fun coming up soon. We have a women's retreat uh, May 17th through 19th, which is a great opportunity to, uh, uh, for fellowship and friendship. And then our vacation Bible experience is uh, the last full week of June, and uh, we'd love to have kids, kids to be part of that. Speaking of kids, our children are singing for the second. They, they, they loved it so much they stayed for the second, the second service to sing for us today. So welcome back. I can't wait to hear this again. kids to come up for the children's time. So some of my friends have already heard this story. So just pretend like you're hearing it for the first time, okay? <laughs> Again, yeah, I'll switch it up a little. So you know, when Jesus taught, 
he would oftentimes, we just did a whole sermon series on Jesus' I am statements. Like he said, I am the good shepherd, I am the vine, I am the truth, the way, and the life. And Jesus oftentimes would point to things that people knew or understand to explain really hard things to understand. And I think that's kind of like what this morning is about, just a little bit, because resurrection is a big word. And it's like, what does it mean? What does it mean when something gets resurrected. And so the, the story that I told this half already, um, I, I have an amazing neighbor who is able to grow what? What was he able to grow? Limes. Limes. Yes, yeah, see, they were listening. And his name was Griff, and Griff limes were just like my most favorite thing. I don't know why. Does anybody else, do you guys like things that are a little tart? And he would bring over like a bag of limes for me because he knew how much I liked them. We were really good neighbors because one day my husband called and said, Griff is in our yard with a ladder because we have an orange tree. And so it was like this mutual, he would just come over and help himself. And one day I got very sad news. And the sad news was my friend Griff moved away. And I was like, oh, that's so sad, because they were really fun neighbors. They would come over, and sometimes we'd even play cards with them, and they had really cute grandkids that they would tell us about. And then my husband told me the even sadder part. He was like, this probably means no more grip lines. <gasps> and I was like, oh, that's so sad. And so for a while, we knew that he was going to move away. And so when he would bring over those limes for me, I knew this is probably it. Like, because I don't know, somebody new might move in and they might not want a lime tree, right? And so one day, I was juicing some of the limes that Mr. Griff brought over for me, and guess what I found? A seed. Just one. Only one seed, which is like a lot of pressure, especially if you've never, ever successfully grown much of anything. But I had this one seed, and so... I, I went on the internet and I looked, how do you grow a lime tree from a seed? And um, they said to get a little pot and put some dirt in it, and then to put the seed in and then put a little more dirt on top. And then they said to take a little piece of saran wrap and put that on top with a rubber band because it makes it like really nice and warm and cozy. And so I did all that. And then guess what happened? Nothing. Nothing. You guys already know. Okay, so <laughs> nothing happened. And I was so sad. Sad. And I was so bummed because all of my hope was in this one little seed and I only had one. And so I didn't have the heart. It, it had been a couple weeks and nothing had happened. And so I just left it because I, I don't know, sometimes hope does weird things to you. And then one day I looked and there was this little teeny tiny green sprout in the top of it. And I got so excited, I took the saran wrap off so that it could have some air. And look, they already know why it's sitting up here. But this is my, this is my little, okay, it's really little, but it's, it's hopeful because there's leaves on it and there's roots that are growing and they're continuing to grow. And I have no idea what's gonna happen because I really don't know how to grow trees. And, but who knows, in like seven to 10 years, according to Google, I could be growing <laughs> limes. But that's okay, because these are worth it. You want to see? See my cute little, it's got, it's got six little leaves, and I think it's happy. You want to see it again? Um, it's, so, so you guys can all keep my little tree in your thoughts and prayers, because I want it to grow. And if you know about trees, please come see me. Um, but that's, that's kind of what happened with Jesus. His friends were so sad, because... Jesus, they, they put him in a grave. They sealed it shut. And then his friend Mary, as we're going to hear, she came to, to pay her honor, to pay respect a couple days later, and Jesus wasn't there. And hope was back. And there was all of the reason to trust that the things that Jesus had said were true. And so I hope that we continue to have hope, even when it seems like this isn't going to work, that we would still believe and trust that God has good things for us. Okay, you have a question. Yeah, is it a Mary or a no, it's a different Mary. There are so many Marys. It was a very popular name. But that's a great question. So I'm going to pray for us, and then there's tables and fun in the back. All right, God, thank you so much that we are not without hope, and as long as you are loose in the world, we can trust and believe in the goodness of your promises. We thank you that 
things continue to grow, even when it doesn't seem possible, and we hope that that will be true for us always. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus does love the children, each and every one. <laughs> I invite you to turn to the prayer page in the bulletin. There are a number of joys and concerns to share. Um, Trish Collins uh, learned last week that uh, the benign tumor in the lining of the brain that they've been watching has grown, and so she's going to need radiation or surgery, not sure which. So it's a little scary time of doctoring here to figure out what's next. So. We will pray her through it, just like we will pray Judy Apple through a stem cell transplant for Parkinson's this Thursday in Florida. And we learned at the first service this morning that Mark Walsh uh, is also having a stem cell transplant uh, for uh, he's on dialysis, and hopefully that will uh, help help his kidneys function. So, prayers for uh, Mark and Judy both. For Marie Bradley, who just received a new aortic valve in the heart last week. George Whitfield, who's been going through. Uh, chemo and a number of our folks, Kay Brickley and Mark and, and uh, Jane, are all, all going through chemotherapy, and we pray for, for each of them and for all of them. Uh, we pray for the loved ones of Helga Olivka, and Helga, of course, was our nursery caregiver here for 30-some years, uh, and a memorial service for her will be held this coming Saturday at 11 o'clock, to which you're all invited. And we pray for Roy Martins and his wife, Vani Varner, uh, in the loss of Bonnie's son in his early 50s as a result of injuries suffered in a, a bike car, bike accident. Um, and for Joe Rack, who sings in our choir, who lost her brother recently, and uh, not long before that, lost a niece as well. Uh, and for Neil Pressa, who lost his grandmother as well. So we pray for all those for whom uh, this is a time of grief, whether the loss is uh, one of many seasons or, or just, a few, just a few days. We pray for our world and the places in need of resurrection, places where there's so much violence and deprivation. We think of Gaza and Israel and Ukraine and, and Yemen and Haiti and, and so many places to name, and we pray for the people there who are caught in the midst of it and for the leaders of nations that a way toward peace can may be found. We pray for our sister faith friends, for our Jewish friends next door in the Jewish Collaborative, uh, for our, our Muslim friends, who are part of the Tri-City Islamic Center, with whom we share uh, the three, our three congregations, uh, uh, have shared fellowship over many years, and it's been a really difficult time for that uh, with all that's going on, but we continue to pray for peace there in, in Israel-Palestine. <clears throat> and today was the last day of Hands of Peace, a mission outreach that brought Israeli and Palestinian young adults here to Carlsbad for the last 10 years to find uh, with American youth to plant seeds for a future peace in the Middle East. And uh, that organization has passed the baton to another one called uh, Seeds of Hope. But there are 800 alumni of that program, many of whom stayed in the homes of every, members of our church and for whom uh, our church families like uh, the Middletons and the Reeses were on the board of directors. Uh, so so we, we pray for all those young people who were part of the Hands of Peace program who are still out there and will still be working for peace. Uh, many. Many, most of them in uh, Israel-Palestine. And we pray for our servicemen and women as well in these challenging times. And lastly, I want to say a huge thank you to those who uh, have worked extra, extra hard these last weeks to prepare for certainly Lent, but also and especially Holy Week and today's Easter service. And that, of course, is our AV team, uh, our audiovisual team, and our sanctuary decorators, and our uh, hospitality team, uh, and then especially really our musicians who work twice a week for, for six weeks to prepare for all this. So I want to thank all of our singers and musicians and for the wonderful commitment that's to be. Thank you. And now Carol will lead us in the prayers of the people. Good morning and happy Easter. 
Let's bow our heads. Father, we come before you joyfully knowing that your precious Son, Jesus Christ, the greatest gift to all of mankind, lives eternally with you in heaven. We are filled with thanksgiving because we are called your children and that our belief in Jesus as your Son will also give us the same eternal life. We confess to you our transgressions and know that you will forgive us. You give us the Holy Spirit to lead us into righteous living in order that our lives will be a credit to you and your love. We strive to be worthy of that great blessing. Good and gracious God, our most glorious creator, as we greet the signs in nature around us, we offer our deepest gratitude. Signs of spring once again regale us in blooming flowers, in the songs of birds, and in the hope of fields soon to be planted. We give you praise for an even greater sign of new life, the resurrection of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, which we especially celebrate at this time. The sadness and despair of his death has given way to the bright promise of immortality, for the resurrection is our guarantee that justice will triumph over brutality. Light will come, overcome darkness, and love will conquer death. As we celebrate, we also dare to ask for your grace, that we may live the promise given to us by imitating the life of Jesus in reaching out to the poor, the marginalized, the least among us, as we strive to be neighbor to all those we meet. Please give your tender care to those in our congregation needing healing and to those grieving the loss of loved ones. We ask your special blessings each and every day on our chosen leaders. Working with them, may we strive to make this great country of ours a beacon of hope and justice in a world hungry for peace and so in need of your love. We praise you this Easter season. Change our lives, change our hearts to be messengers of Easter joy and hope. We make our prayer through Jesus Christ, our risen Lord forever, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Without light, without heaven. 
On Easter, I often think about the folks who are here for somebody else's sake. You know, people have serious doubts about this whole Jesus thing, but maybe they're here because mom wants them here or their grandmother did or something like that. I think about them because I'm sort of one of them. I think Easter is a lot to believe, actually. I think it's a lot to believe, this resurrection thing. Sometimes I think it would be better for people to explore the Christian faith not not on Easter Day, the big day, but just on an ordinary day, when we're maybe reading one of the parables Jesus told that's as fresh today as it was the day he told it, or talking about the healing of a blind man and thinking about, well, how is it that, okay, I can see with my eyes, but I'm really blind to some things too, and where do I need healed? Those kinds of things might be, might be easier, but here we are, it's Easter Day. Let's, let's begin with the end in mind, as Stephen Covey used to say the end in mind. So here we are at the Easter story. We find it in the Gospel of John. I'm going to summarize the first part of it here for a moment. Jesus was crucified, of course, on Good Friday. He's crucified at the intersection of those in religious power and political power. Right at the center there, he's crucified. They put him on the cross. Religious and political power puts him there. And he dies. And after he dies, Joseph of Arimathea, who's a secret disciple, the Bible says, and Nicodemus, who was a leader of the Jewish council, but he had some questions. He was curious about Jesus, but before he would only come to him in the darkness at night. The two of them come to take his body down from the cross in the daylight, stepping out of the darkness into the daylight. They take his body, they prepare it for burial according to the true Jewish tradition, and they put the body in a tomb, which is like a cave hewn out of a rock wall, and they roll a stone in front of it because they have to get home because it's almost the Sabbath. With nightfall comes the Sabbath, and then you can't do any work. So Saturday happens, no work is done, and it's uh, Sunday morning, and Mary comes to the tomb while it's still dark, John tells us. It's still dark. Mary Magdalene, this is. As uh, Eileen said, there are a lot of Marys, but this is Mary Magdalene. And uh, most of what we think we know about Mary Magdalene in the common is really not right. Mary Magdalene was healed by Jesus. She was one of the women who were followers of Jesus. Uh, And that's really all we know about Mary Magdalene. There's no, I don't know how to, I don't know how to love him as in Jesus Christ Superstar. None of that's in the Bible anywhere. She's one of his friends and followers who in a moment will call him Lord. Anyway, she goes to the tomb in the morning alone and she sees that the stone has moved away. So she runs back to the disciples to tell them and two of the disciples run to the tomb with her and they look inside the tomb to see what what it is. She's afraid somebody's stolen the body and the body's not there, not there. But the two disciples don't really know what to make of it. They're not really sure. They end up going back. But Mary Magdalene stays. And we pick up the story here with the 11th verse. Hear the word of God. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head, the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, They have taken away my Lord and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? And supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you've laid him and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. And then she must have tried to reach him, tried to touch him, to hold him. And Jesus said to her, do not hold on to me because I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. The word of the Lord, thanks be to God. Pray with me. O Lord, may the words of my mouth, the meditations of all of our hearts, be pleasing in your sight. You who are our rock and our redeemer. 
Amen. Now, most of you know that we have the risen Christ here in our stained glass, uh, but you might not all know that below Jesus' left shoulder, uh, you can see Mary, Mary Magdalene, if you look for her there. When our team was working on the stained glass, they said, we would like the first preacher of the gospel in our window. And the first Christian preacher is not one of the 12 disciples, it's Mary Magdalene because she returned to the disciples and said, I have seen the risen Christ. She's the first one. So here she is with her hands telling the story. So as we pick up our reading today, Mary's in tears. She looks in the tomb, the body's not there, but the angels are, and they want to know, woman, why are you weeping? In just a few minutes, the gardener, the gardener, is going to ask Mary the same question. Why are you weeping? And let's stop right there. Why are you weeping is a great question. The writer Frederick Buechner says this about tears. You never know what may cause them. The sight of the ocean can do it, or a piece of, hearing a piece of music, or seeing a face that you've never seen before. A pair of somebody's old shoes can do it. You can never be sure, but what you can be sure of is that whenever you find tears in your eyes, especially unexpected tears, it's well to play, pay the closest attention. They're not only telling you something about the mystery of your own life, but more often than not, God is speaking to you through them of the mystery of where you've come from and is summoning you to where, if your soul is to be saved, you should go to next. Myself, I don't find myself in tears too often, not streaming down the sides of my face, but the older I get, the more and more my tears do fill, my eyes do fill up with something. Just watching the NCAA basketball tournament, I mean, I can, I played enough basketball that when those teams that are defeated walk off the floor, their shoulders slumped, their dreams destroyed, I know what that feels like. And I wrote that line before my team got totally destroyed in yesterday's Brack tournament game. You know, the, I see a photo of my lifelong friend, Carrie, or I walk around this campus and places where some of the wonderful people here who have been part of the life of this church, and I'm used to seeing them, and I don't see them here anymore, at least not with the eyes. With my eyes, I don't see them. But I know they ought to be there. Then something comes into my eyes. When you see something terrible happening to children. So I used to stifle tears when I felt them, but I don't anymore. And neither should you, because Beekner's right. God's doing something. God's doing something in our tears. We know why Mary's weeping. Her grief is wrenching. On the one hand, we're talking about losing her teacher, uh, the one whom she calls Lord. But on another level, a very human level, she's losing someone she loves, someone she calls friend. And she knows she'll never, never see him again that way. So we know about that kind of grief, don't we? All of us do. We've all had that kind of grief. Because this world, with all of its beauty, and it is beautiful and wonderful and amazing, it's also tragic. The clock is always ticking, and the end of our days comes, comes to all of us. But it's still a good question. Why am I weeping? to think about what it is that I've lost. And I don't think you can really understand what it is you've lost when you lose someone until you really lose them. That's when you know what you're missing, what might have been that will now never be. Sometimes that weeping feels like something of a gift almost, sort of like what Shakespeare said when he said, parting is such sweet sorrow. But sometimes that grief feels stark overwhelming, and sometimes it's, it's all of that and more. But no matter what grief feels like, the weeping is a measure 
of the love. So there's Mary outside the tomb weeping in front of someone she supposes is the gardener. And you know, maybe she's not as wrong as it sounds. If you think back to the Garden of Eden, the Lord is the original gardener. So maybe she's saying more than she knows when she thinks it's the gardener. But still, there she stands, the risen Christ face to face, resurrection, staring her down, and she does not know it. She does not know it. I wonder how often the risen Christ stands in front of us, and we don't know it. How often resurrection is staring us in the face, and we don't see. What the gospel stories tell us is that it's not just on Easter, but over and over and over again, that this is the pattern we see in human life of ending and a beginning, of losing and recovery, of death, dying, and resurrection, new life. You see it over and over again, every place, the parables of the prodigal son and the lost sheep, the, the people who are trapped by their past until Jesus sets them free of it. The paralyzed man who can suddenly walk again and the, the woman who's healed of her illness, over and over again, you know, when Jesus tells his disciples why he's come in the Gospel of John, he doesn't say, this is all about the forgiveness of sins. He doesn't say, you need to go to church more. What he says is, I've come that you may have life and have it abundantly. Life, not just phoning it in, not just going through the motions, but life so that you're really alive, so that at the end of your days you don't you don't look at yourself in the mirror and say, I wish I'd done more. I would wish I'd done something. I wish I'd really lived my life. No, I've come that you may have life. That's what Jesus is all about. So this pattern of resurrection, it happens. It's what God does over and over and over again. This pattern of ending and beginning of loss and recovery, death and resurrection. These are the fingerprints of God. And it happens long before we leave this world to what's next. Resurrection, I'm convinced, is standing there staring at us all the time. All the time. I'm thinking of every alcohol and drug counselor that I have ever known. And none of them started out that way. For all, all of them, there was a time in their lives when they looked into the mirror and what they saw looking back at them was an addict. All drug and alcohol counselors are addicts. And when they looked in the mirror then, they did not see resurrection looking back at them, I guarantee you. And yet that's what happened to get them from being an addict to counseling them, to showing them how to escape their addiction. When they looked in the mirror, resurrection was actually staring them in the face, and they didn't know it. I'm thinking of the black civil rights leader, I can't, I can't remember which one, who was asked about the defeats and the losses and the failures of the, of the movement. And he said with a rueful smile that every loss, every defeat, every failure was one step closer to the day when the right to vote would belong to everyone one step closer to what they were building, one more rock in the wall to building what needed to be. Whether or not he was around to see it happen. He didn't say it this way, but he was trusting in resurrection even when he couldn't see it. I'm thinking of Viktor Frankl, an Austrian Jew who spent years in a concentration camp during World War II. He would later become a psychiatrist and author of a book that's still in print and still worth reading, Man's Search for Meaning. But then he did not know that he would survive. When prisoners would be moved to a new camp, he reported, they learned to look when they arrived at the new camp to see whether there were smokestacks there or not. Because if there were no smokestacks, then it was a work camp 
not a death camp, and they had a chance. What's it like to live like that? At one of those work camps, Viktor Frankl and his fellow prisoners would head out before dawn to their work site every day. Every morning, they would step out into the darkness and the cold, walking in formation, and the only light to be found was in a farmhouse. And they could look through the window of the farmhouse to the mother cooking breakfast, to the children getting ready for school, to the farmer putting on his boots to go out and work the farm. Looking through that window, what he saw was just an ordinary life. Just an ordinary life. And the fact that someone in this terrible, really broken, violent, chaotic world was still living a normal life gave him hope that maybe, just maybe, there would be a normal life for him, for his family, for those with whom he was marching too. It was literally a light shining in the darkness. Resurrection staring him in the face. The risen Christ is out there loose in the world, in the most unlikely places. Resurrection is there staring us in the face, even in the most unexpected circumstances. Mary in the garden, even she had experienced this resurrection pattern. She was one of those Jesus healed, but she wasn't seeing it then. And we usually don't see it either. Not when our hope is exhausted, not when it seems like hope is gone. But for Mary, then something amazing, something incredible, something incredibly ordinary happened, actually. She heard the sound of her name. Mary. Mary. If you've been following along with us these last weeks, we've been reading through John. You can't hear that without remembering Jesus saying, I am the good shepherd. I call my sheep by name. My sheep know my voice. Mary, Mary. Does that happen to you? Maybe not exactly like that, but you're at a dead end. It feels like all is lost. There's no hope. But you hear your name spoken, not, not with your ears, but with your heart. Something's calling you. You may not have put the name of Christ on it, but life is calling you. Something's calling you. Something's calling you to say, there's more. There's more. Whether you see it as the good shepherd or not, you know that despite all the odds, there's more, that you're not done yet, that all is not lost, that there's a lot of life left to live. I think one of the fringe benefits of being a friend, a follower of Jesus, is that when he does call you by name, that you've got a better chance of hearing it just because you've been trying to listen for it, trying to hear it all along. So Jesus is in the resurrection business, and if you listen for your name, eventually your name will be called. The truth is, it's a whole world Christ is resurrecting, Jesus isn't about saving this person and that person and pulling them like in a, through an escape hatch out of this world into heaven. No, God is about resurrecting the whole world. If you read the Bible, it's very clear. He's about resurrecting all of it. Read the very last book, Revelation, the very end. There's a new heaven and a new earth. All of it's being resurrected. So all that we do to build a better life for one another, for those who have least in our world, for those who are most hurting and most broken, all of that is in service of that new heaven and new earth that God's working on already, that resurrection promise, because God is resurrecting all of it. So for our part, we're to be Easter people 
in a Good Friday world. That's William Sloan Coffin's phrase, where I heard it first. To be Easter people in a Good Friday world, called to trust in this pattern of resurrection that's really found everywhere if we look for it. To trust that resurrection is there, staring us in the face even when we don't see it. To trust that Christ will call us by name when the time comes for recovery, for a new beginning, for a new life. So that means we're people of hope. Prisoners of hope is what Zechariah the prophet called it. I love that phrase, prisoners of hope. We're bound by the hope that this Christ who promises resurrection will deliver on that promise. And we trust that Christ will do exactly that, including when this life is over. As one day it will be for all of us, we can surely trust that the resurrection is on the other side as well. So we choose to be Easter people, to trust this pattern of resurrection, to be people of hope. And we spent a good bit of these last weeks here talking about hope, and I want to end actually where we began several Sundays ago with words about hope that were shared with me and then with you from our friend Jane Savage, who with her husband Robert know quite a bit about hope. The source appears to be someone on Twitter named Michael, but I don't have been able to find out anything more about him. But his words speak for themselves. Here's what he says. People speak of hope as if it is this delicate, ephemeral thing made of whispers and spider webs. It's not. Hope has dirt on her face, blood on her knuckles, the grit of cobblestones in her hair, and just spat out a tooth as she rises for another go. Pray with me. Lord, make us prisoners of that kind of hope. Help us to trust in that kind of resurrection in this world, not just in the next. Help us to see the opportunities there are to be a part of you resurrecting this world that we live in that needs so much, no, so much love, so much life. And in those moments, Lord, when our hope is frayed, when our expectations are gone, when we fear all is lost, Give us the ears to hear your voice that calls our name, that promises us that your last word for us is life in this world and the next. We pray in the one, the name of the one who is our hope, Jesus Christ our Savior, and for his sake, and for our, the world's sake, and for our own sakes too. And let all God's people say, Amen. We worship God now with our gifts and with song.
Baptist, but let all God's people say, Amen. Amen. Ooh, I think we can do it even louder. Let all God's people say, Amen. Amen. Well, thank you. So today of all days, let us remember that life is short and we have but little time to gladden the hearts of those who travel with us. So let us be swift to love and make haste to be kind. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and abide with you with those whom you love and with those whom God loves, which is all of us and each of us, every single one. Amen. Yeah.